This morning, my daughter tried on three different outfits before she did finally decided on a fourth that had the appropriate amount of twirl to wear to school. She's three and a half. Sometimes I think she has too many choices. But as a parent, it's my responsibility to provide her with choices. Choices to help her grow, to learn, and to thrive. Any parent or any child expert will tell you that choices are important for children to have ownership over their lives. And I completely agree. But what about my other kids at Zoo Atlanta? Choice is just as important to them. Choice is complexity. Choice is freedom. Choice drives what they need. But zoos don't really work that way. So far, choice and complexity aren't part of our regular regime of care and welfare. But that's just surviving. That's not thriving. And no animal has taught me about this more than Holly. Holly was 11 when I first met her and worked with her troop at a zoo in the Midwest. Holly immediately stood out to me for her spunk and her energy. But she was a little different. She had some abnormal behaviors, behaviors that we didn't see in other chimpanzees there. She would hair pluck, she would rock, she kind of would glaze over and go off into her own little world. These were all different behaviors. So at first we thought maybe she was on the autism spectrum. She didn't pick up on subtle social cues. She'd go and sit next to a chimp, they'd scoot away, she'd scoot on over. She didn't seem to get it. When the alpha male would give a big display and the rest of the females would run away screaming, Holly would do the same. But yet, after a couple minutes, when everyone else had calmed down, Holly was still screaming. Or if another individual had food, she would get all in their personal space to try to smell it, taste it. Which nobody really likes anyone in their personal space when they're eating. So it continued. We were curious. We wanted to know what was going on with Holly. So we consulted with an occupational therapist. She said that what Holly was exhibiting was similar to sensory integration disorder, a condition in humans where sensory information isn't processed correctly, and it comes out in the behaviors. So we weren't sure, is this genetic? Does this have something to do with a trauma early in Holly's life? Something about her environment? We didn't know. So it kind of reminded me a little bit of the work by Harry Harlow, where he would take socially isolated rhesus macaques, create these environments of, to deprive them of social input and other sensory information, and then later introduce other socially inept individuals or young, outgoing individuals. Those young, outgoing rhesus macaques functioned as therapists, and they started seeing social recovery. So that led me to think, OK, what if Holly was a needy child? What if Holly was my child? We'd talk about it, we'd conference, we'd see experts. I would adapt her environment for her. The light bulb went off. This was revolutionary thinking. This was taking a human model and applying it to animals. Whoa. <laughs> this was amazing. So we conferenced, we talked about it. What if Holly was a needy child? What would we do? So we came up with plans on how to provide Holly choice. How could Holly control her environment more? What would Holly want if she could choose? What would Holly do if she could choose? This was still so revolutionary. So we went along the ideas of choice. But choice in animals looks different than it does in humans. So everything from how many times to hit the snooze button, or which twirly dress you're going to wear to school, we are bombarded with choices. But in a zoo environment, there isn't that freedom of choice. So how can we incorporate that in and help Holly? But we're not going to just help Holly. We're not going to create something in a vacuum. We're going to assess the entire troop. I wouldn't just take my child to a single therapist. We'd go to family therapy. <laughs> so how can we incorporate this all in for chimpanzees? So we started by looking at our enrichment program. 
we just started changing the environment, giving her different toys, different tasks, creating activity centers with tubs of corn kernels she could really reach in and play with, heavy tubs they could push and pull, choice of activity. Then we looked at Holly as a chimpanzee. Chimpanzees in the wild live in what's called fission-fusion societies. They don't live within a tight community that sees each other every day. They're not in social proximity. They break off into smaller groups and do what they need to do that day. Some may forage, some may go have tea by the river, whatever they may do. So let's allow that choice. They could be inside, outside, within view of the public, not within view of the public. And oddly enough, they chose to keep an eye on their human caretakers, the food providers. <laughs> that gave them the hint as to what was about to occur within their environment. They knew if enrichment was coming, training, they were able to get a little bit of a hint into that newly changing environment. So we continued. We continued making change, giving them choice, and then social choice. Who do you want to be near? When do you want to be near them? By giving more space and freedom, we started seeing changes in Holly, changes within the group. Her abnormal behaviors were decreasing. The time she would spend in social proximity with her friends was increasing. We were seeing change. With this change, we really wanted to make sure that we were addressing every other animal. This isn't just about chimpanzees. We currently use this model at Zoo Atlanta for all of our animals. Right now, we're doing a process with our African elephants. I have students that come to the zoo every day and take daily behavioral monitoring data on Tara and Kelly, our two African elephants. What are they doing? How are they interacting with each other? How are they interacting with their environment, their enrichment? And we can constantly adapt and change our program to tailor make their needs to ensure their lives are full of choice and complexity. They have freedom to do what they want when they want to do it. They're not at our all-inclusive resort. It also allows us to give them control. They can tell us what they need and when they need it. And again, what a revolutionary thought to change the way zoos are focusing and really move it around we're not just meeting basic needs. We're addressing the individual needs, the social needs, the emotional needs, physical, intellectual, everything about an individual and everything within that social group. Now, I'm not an expert on humans. Far from it, actually. But I think people can take a hint from all this animal work. Tolerance, patience, we worked with the group that was incredibly tolerant about Holly to begin with, but we started rewarding being around her. If we were in a training session and an individual was sitting next to Holly, we'd give them grapes or juice. We never forced it, we just encouraged it. So being near Holly all of a sudden became a positive experience. And again, we saw that social proximity getting smaller and smaller. Holly was making friends again. So minor changes in the environment, addressing her needs and the needs of the group, created improvement. Dr. Seuss, you can't really give a talk without quoting Dr. Seuss. Sometimes the question is complicated, but the answer is simple. And here it seemed incredibly simple. Why not treat them the way we would want to be treated? <laughs> 